This is Montage with your host, Ralph Rennick. Tonight on Montage, Joe Abril talks with Nicholas Johnson, a former member of the Federal Communications Commission, who's quite outspoken in his views on the role and responsibilities of television in our society. We'll also look into the strange phenomenon known as pyramid power. First, we have a report that concerns all of us because all of us are subject to what is called the rising tide of crime, burglary, robbery, and sometimes connected with those rape and murder. I don't need to mention statistics. You have probably seen it moving closer to your life every day if it hasn't struck you already. An alarm system may be the only thing you can use to keep the burglar from your brand new television set. You can't build your home like a bank vault. No matter how strong the defense is, it is always possible with enough work to break in. But you can convince the criminal that he is going to be detected and caught. Businesses have discovered this with the use of guards. They don't seem very potent sometimes, but they are there and watching. That is what an alarm system does. It hears or sees or feels an intruder approach and notifies people to be on guard. I don't think, uh, I don't think anything's safe, 100% safe. Anything can be defeated. The only thing is it's, it acts as a deterrent for number one. If a, a burglar knows that there's an alarm system in a house or a business, I think they would think twice. And if he's a real professional and he wants to get to it, I think there's always a way, but the only thing you're doing is making it a hard target. Harden the target is the name of the game here. Just let them know that you're prepared for them. This home in Dade County has had a perimeter alarm system installed. The designer of the system, Ron Cook of Electronic Security Consultants, took Gary Craven on a tour. The front windows here, how do you protect the front window? Well, there's two different applications applied here on these particular awning type windows. If you notice, the screens are wired. The wire is threaded in the screen and also along the side. Now, the thing The glass here, itself isn't protected. No, the glass is not protected. Here, they would they'd have to force the window and break the screen out. Even if they try to cut the screen, the wire is so fine that any type of force on it will break the wire right away, which will activate the alarm system. Could you leave those windows open? Yes, you could. Yes, you could leave them open. It's fine because the alarm system is on the screen. Uh, this here prevents anybody that the air condition goes off or it's cool or something like that. They can always control their windows, leave them open in that way, and they still have the protection, the perimeter protection, what you're after in this type of system. Right. Well, what about the big window? Then? Well, the large window here, if you notice up here in the top left-hand corner, you will see this is called what we call a window bug. And what this does, this will activate if anybody breaks this window. Even though it's not next to that? Yes. This will cover this whole area. It's designed to cover a large glass area. And this here, it's a very neat application. That's why we like it. It looks a lot better than tape. And also, it's, uh, it does the job, we think, better. It cuts down on maintenance, and people can clean their windows, don't have to worry about the tape or anything like that on them. That's why we use this, and it gives you the same amount of protection. How does it work? Well, it works on a device that it's more or less, I said, the closest thing I could bring it to is like a mercury switch, that once the glass is broke, the mercury will naturally tilt and make contact in it. It's very detects similar. the motion of breaking. It, yeah, then. that's right. Once the glass, but usually if they break the glass down here, the whole glass will shatter. A selling point of the perimeter system is that it can be left on at all times, except when going through a door. Every possible entrance to the home has been bugged, and they all feed into this central box. The box has its own emergency power supply, and all of the devices are also wired against tampering even the sirens outside. For this house, the system cost about $1,500 and has been custom made and installed in the home. A more mobile unit is a sound detecting unit that requires no wiring. This unit costs about $600 and was demonstrated for our cameras. Well, the instant the burglar makes a breaking and entering type sound anywhere around the home, the home fills with lights and you get a tremendous noise that fires off and scares the devil out of them. Now what happens if my dog barks or the telephone rings? The Magnum can be programmed to filter these sounds out, which it does. As an example, right now we're sitting and talking right in front of the computer, and it's filtering out this type sound. But now watch the differences. I'll simulate a breaking and entering type sound. 
The extent of electronic wizardry seems almost endless now and is becoming more refined very rapidly. TPT Products deals mostly in systems for condominium buildings and connects many features, including fire protection, into one system that is then monitored by a guard. We feel today to do a total system in a high-rise is really what's necessary in a residential high-rise building. And you have to start with the very access to the property itself. In other words, you have to limit uh, traffic onto the premises, into the parking areas. And we do that by means of gate control or access control. We then want to limit the access to the building by locking all the downstairs doors because in a high-rise building a front door that's unlocked is just like the front door of your apartment or home being unlocked where you're in a residence so the building must have all their downstairs doors secured and locked and then we provide a means a telephonic door control system we call entryguard so that the non-resident can call upstairs over conventional phone lines and be identified and then the apartment owner can release the door downstairs over the telephone. And this secures the downstairs to the building. We then provide individual security for each one of the apartments to give intrusion to protect against burglary, to fire with toxic gas and smoke detection, and uh, medical emergencies. Going back to a central point. We have now seen the devices are available to assist in protecting your home apartment or condominium. They're not cheap and they're not foolproof. But if you seek out a reliable firm from the many in the industry and match the system to your needs, it certainly can help to protect you. Ours is the most technically advanced civilization the world has ever known. But we still wonder if some of the ancient civilizations didn't know a few tricks that have been lost to us through the centuries. For instance, science is still at a loss to explain how mummies were so perfectly preserved inside the great pyramids of Egypt. Today, a growing number of people believe the answer to that riddle, and many others, is the shape of the pyramid itself. Maury Oliker reports. Don't be alarmed by the term pyramid power. It's not a political movement to restore the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, but people who believe in pyramid power will tell you those long gone rulers of a once great civilization knew the secret to a mysterious power that we are only just beginning to understand. Strange energies generated by the Earth's magnetic field and captured and focused by the pyramid. You can build your own pyramids. Any well-stocked bookstore probably has one or more volumes that will tell you how to create the exact dimensions and angles for a scale model of the Great Pyramid of Giza and how to position it in line with the Earth's magnetic field so that it will work. And then you can puzzle it out along with some of our own amateur scientists here at WTVJ. One of our staff members has tried keeping raw meat, bananas, and other foods under a pyramid. They dry out but don't seem to rot at all. He and another staffer drink water left standing on a commercially made pyramid generator, a collection of small pyramids built into a magnet so that it needs no positioning to the earth. They say it helps their ulcers. And if you really want to put yourself into your experiments, you can make or buy a pyramid to sit over your bed. Our crew member who does this says he wakes up in the morning feeling great. And here's an idea that seems doomed to failure, but I won't laugh if he wins the Irish sweepstakes. There are gurus of pyramid power, people who research the phenomenon, write books, and give lectures. One of the best known is Pat Flanagan, who talked to me recently about the practical uses he foresees for pyramids. Well, we have two areas. One is an area of, of hardware, and uh, one is a, uh, a new a seed stimulant that we've developed, we call it an electrocatalytic seed stimulant using these energy fields. And uh, last year in the first crop testing from Indiana down through Texas and a wide variety of climatic conditions, we have obtained a 300% increase in yield in various grain crops. This uh, may promise a temporary uh, solving of, uh, I believe, the world food shortage. Beyond that, I believe that we can expand uh, man's lifespan tremendously by learning how to apply these fields to the human body. For instance, we're finding uh, correlation from other uh, scientists around the world. Dr. Harold Saxon Burr, who was a professor of uh, Yale University, uh, wrote a book called Blueprint for Immortality on 
uh, energy field surrounding a human body, we're finding that the energy field she is describing is the same kind of energy field we find in the pyramid. And what we're speaking of is that if we can charge these fields and adjust them, that we can increase our basic lifespan, we can change our lifestyle to improve our general energy state of our own bodies. We have, uh, in, in simple terms, we have a microcosm of energy within ourselves, uh, which is a reflection of the macrocosm occurring in the outer world. We have an internal energy crisis as well as an external energy crisis, and this needs solving. Here at Montage, we're interested in science, too. So we're trying our own experiment. We purchased a small pyramid generator from the local distributor of pyramid products, and we're going to see if it helps make plants grow any better, as claimed. Our test subjects are 10 Eumoipus plants I picked up at a nursery. On Wednesday, I transplanted them into two window box planters, two groups of five each. The two planters are sitting side by side in my living room, under a window that gives them direct sun every morning. The plants vary in size somewhat, but the two groups average about the same. What we're going to do is water one group with regular tap water and the other group with water that sits on top of our pyramid generator. Both groups will get the same amount of water and we'll measure them every week to see how they do. Will the pyramid generator do something to the water and make the plants grow better? We'll know in a few weeks. And when we find out, you'll be the first to know. Keep watching Montage for our dramatic announcement coming sometime this fall. We'll be looking forward to that. By the way, Ralph Frenick Jr. has been using a pyramid to try to keep his razor blades sharp, but as far as I can tell, he better change his name to Nick. Montage will be right back. Tonight we're going to look at television from uh, a very critical vantage point. Uh, my guest is Nicholas Johnson, former commissioner of the FCC, uh, now publisher of a magazine called Access, which talks about the public's right to the airwaves through television and radio stations, and uh, also an organization called Media Watch, newsletter of the National Citizens Committee for Broadcasting. So tonight's your night out there to find out uh, what you can do about what you don't like about uh, Channel 4 and all the other channels in this country, and uh, welcome to Montage. Thank you very Johnson. much. Yeah. Do you find a lot of broadcasters a little apprehensive to have you on a program? Uh, you're, you're, yes, you're I was going to begin by saying I, I appreciate your either your confidence, your courage, your naivete, <laughs> or your uh, darn <laughs> foolishness to have me on here at all, see? So I appreciate that. We don't, uh, we don't get on very often. Well, that's kind of sad. Now, that bothers me. You well, said. it really is. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, I don't think a responsible broadcaster has anything to fear at all from uh, healthy public participation in the process. We've got uh, one of the, the trends of what's been going on in the country the last five, ten years has been a desire on the part of people to participate in uh, all the major institutions that affect their lives. Uh, employees want to have more impact on the workplace. Uh, uh, students want to have more impact on educational institutions. Consumers want to have more impact on their stores where they do business, beef boycott that was held, people want to stop freeways or start them or whatnot, and we're learning that we can control the environment and the community we live in and the, the way in which we live and that we don't have to just sit back and take it, that there are tools and ways of going about changing things that work. Well now when you were appointed to the FCC you very quickly developed a reputation as being a, a rabble rouser, I'll use the phrase for want of a better one, but you were kind of shaking the establishment up. Did you do that on purpose? Well, I did what I did on purpose. Yeah. I, 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 all I did was just uh, I would hold public readings from the Constitution of the United States and the uh, United States Code Acts of Congress, and I would tell people what the law said the rights were. And as a result of that, I was called a radical because, of course, you're not supposed to let the people know what the law says. They might go uh, applying it. The law in the case of broadcasting uh, gives the public uh, much greater rights than they have even with regard to freeways and supermarkets and environmental pollution. Because the law with regard to broadcasting says in the very first section of the act having to do with radio and television stations, that nobody can own a radio or television station. There will be no right of property in the license, the act says. What that means in practical effect is that every three years, this station and every other television station in the United States 
lose their right to broadcast, have to come into the FCC as if they were a new applicant for a station, and ask for a license for another three-year period, much the same way as a, a member of Congress has to run for office every two years. You don't have a right to be reelected uh, to Congress, and you don't have a right to be reelected to be a broadcaster in this community. And once the public knows that, that there is a license renewal process and that the public can participate in that license renewal process, then you begin to have a really meaningful dialogue between all the segments of the society and the broadcaster who so affects that society. You know, I walked into your lobby. I made note of this because I thought it was so good. It's written by your president, Michael Wolfson. Mitchell Wolfson. Mitchell? Mitchell, yeah. forgive me. We That's wouldn't right. want to get that wrong. Um, it's called the Wometco Philosophy, and in it it says, we realize fully that we are responsible for the economic, political, and social climate in which we operate. Now, I've never heard a broadcaster come straight out and admit that before, but that's the truth. The fact is that television does shape the social, political, and economic climate in which all of us have to live. What do you think of most uh, television programs on the air today? Well, I think the basic problem with television is its dependence upon commercialism. That affects what programs get on the air, what programs don't. It affects what gets censored out of programs and what gets put into programs. It, it affects uh, uh, all kinds of things, uh, the kinds of public service announcements that can be run. Public service announcements are prepared by the same advertising agencies, the same corporations that are putting on all the other commercials. Do you, do you agree with former Commissioner Minow, Chairman Minow, saying this is a vast wasteland television? Well, that was a cute phrase. Uh, when he left office, you know, uh, uh, the last question he was asked at his last press conference was, uh, Chairman Minow, do you... Uh, still think that it is a vast wasteland and he said no I think as a result of our efforts here it is now can fairly be characterized as only a half vast wasteland. <laughs> so he felt there's been some progress made. I think there has. I think that the uh, we now have hundreds of groups around the country that are involved in media reform activities of various kinds that the National Citizens Committee for Broadcasting has set up to try to serve us. And I think they are having an impact. Uh, but do you think they're having too much of an impact? I, I do hear broadcasters say that it's really no longer free enterprise at all. It's, it's just a, a really a government-controlled entity. Well, we're not talking about government control now. We're talking about just exactly the opposite. We're talking about the philosophy of, uh, of Ronald Reagan and George Wallace and, and others that are trying to break down the federal government and put power back in the communities and back in the hands of the people. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about groups here in Miami <coughs> Uh, that are concerned about employment practices for women and blacks, that are concerned about children's programming, that are concerned about over-commercialization, that are concerned about the erosion of family and moral values in our society. Groups in Miami being able to come in and deal with the station manager of this station and the other stations in this community one-on-one -on -one and have it out with them. Right here in Miami, we're not talking about some far off in Washington government agency uh, having some kind of control. Well, but there are regulations imposed by the FCC. The regulations Washington. require you to sit down and talk with the public. That's what yeah. the regulations are, and I think those kind of regulations are perfectly appropriate. They don't bother me a bit. Yeah, I agree. I, I think some journalists, I'm a journalist, uh, have some trouble with, the, with, the, with dividing the rights of the printed press, which have no encumbrances whatsoever and the journalistic rights uh, in broadcasting, which are encumbered or enhanced, whichever way you want to look at it, but do have some, some uh, regulations they have to adhere to. Do you see any problems there in the free press? Well, the big difference is that anybody who wants to can try to start a newspaper. Now, they may go bankrupt, yeah. but anybody who tries to start a television station in Miami today is not only going to go bankrupt, they're also going to go to jail because you have to have a license to operate a station. Yeah. And therein lies an enormous difference. There have, in fact, been uh, a new rash of suburban newspapers, underground newspapers, and so forth. There have not been in radio and television stations. There are more people that want to operate them than there are stations available to be licensed. And that means necessarily that when you operate this station, you do it as very much like a public utility. The Supreme Court has said there is no right of private censorship in a medium that's not open to all. 
that uh, you have an obligation under the Fairness Doctrine to deal with controversial issues of public importance in this community. And you have an obligation under the ascertainment requirements to go out and talk to the people in this community to figure out what are the most important problems and how you can make the greatest contribution to making Miami more responsive to the people that live here and, and make it better, get closer to the ideals and what they'd like to make of it. Uh, and those are responsibilities that fall upon you because you are sort of a, in a monopoly or an oligopoly. There are only just a handful of you here, and uh, you've got all the power. And that means that you've got to be like a public utility. You've got to be open to all points of view. The Fairness Doctrine says that you not only have to deal with controversial issues of public importance, but that when you do it, you have to give an opportunity for all points of view to be heard. What do you think of the family hour controversy? I think it's fraud. Do you think family hour worked? No. I well, think it was worked down in secret session between the chairman of the FCC and the heads of the networks uh, to defraud the American people and divert their attention from uh, a very serious problem, which is the matter of, uh, of violence and what television is doing to our, our religious and family values in this country. Uh, and uh, there is a need for an exercise of some responsibility on the part of the networks. And uh, uh, they, they had to come up with something. They didn't want to take any effective action. And they did this. Uh, they did it illegally without holding hearings on it. It's now being contested in court. Uh, and I suspect the court's going to find that it was illegal. It's been opposed by uh, church groups and uh, uh, as well as National Citizens Committee for Broadcasting and others. Were you forced off the FCC? I know your term expired. but No, you have a seven-year term. Did you want and to my term expired June 30th of 1973, and uh, I, no replacement was forthcoming. So under law, you continue to serve until a replacement does come. I stayed on until December. There was still no replacement. They were hung up. Uh, yeah. uh, Nixon wouldn't withdraw this appointee he wanted to put on who was out of the broadcasting industry. Preposterous notion. You take a broadcasting company executive and put him on the Federal Communications Commission. The Senate wouldn't even hold hearings, let alone approve him. Nixon was too stubborn to withdraw the name. And so it just finally seemed to me the only thing I could do is just leave and uh, walk out of there, and then at least hearings would have to be held, and it would kind of move the thing Don't along. Don't you miss it. being a commissioner with all the no, inherent look, power I, that goes with that? No, I did it for seven and a half years, and, and uh, you know, it's time to move on and uh, do something else. I, so I moved my act down the street, and we're... Uh, would you represent uh, one of the networks if they came to you as a lawyer and no, asked you to take no. their... No, I've case. devoted my life to media reform. I had the opportunity that every commissioner has to take the $150,000 a year job in industry as a lawyer, a corporate executive. I decided the public paid to give me the background and experience that I've got with this. Uh, and the, the, the luck that's come my way and the education I had and the experiences I had as a law clerk on the Supreme Court and so forth. And I'd rather take that experience and use it to serve the public. And uh, so that's what I'm doing with the National Citizens Committee for Broadcasting, National Citizens Communications Lobby, Access Magazine, Media Watch. I do public speaking around the country on these subjects. How can the, people reach subjects. you? How, where do they write to you? Well, thank you. I'm glad you asked. You. Yeah. It's uh, just 1346 Connecticut Avenue in Washington, D.C. Nicholas One, Johnson. Yeah, Nicholas Johnson, 1346 Connecticut Avenue, Washington, D.C. Uh, we have to pause just a moment for a message. We'll be right back. Next week on Montage, we'll continue our series, Water, Any Drop to Drink. Part three looks at chloroform and other exotic chemicals in Miami's water. What do these unwanted substances mean to you and what's being done about them? We'll also show you the safe way to enjoy riding your bicycle around town. And Joe Averill will chat with former Tarzan and former Flash Gordon. Remember him? Buster Crab. That's our montage for tonight. This is Ralph Rennick. Good evening. Mm -hmm.